Good day again, it's Professor Resnick. Today we want to discuss what are some consequences of capitalist expansion. And what I want to try and show you is how Marx explains that capitalist expansion in and of itself carries within it the seeds of a contraction. And then the contraction carries within it the possibility of expansion. So what we have is the business cycle. So in addition to class exploitation, that's Marx's critique of capitalism, he provides another critique, which is the ups and downs of capitalism, this kind of anarchy of production, in the words of Engels. So l let me begin. If you recall from last time, we discussed how capitalist expansion can be characterized by an expansion of capital accumulation, that was K-star, plus all the other expansions that capitalist enterprises engage in. That was that lambda. Let me put that on the whiteboard so we have it in front of us. So the rate of profit is equal to K-star plus lambda. And in your notes, you recall that K-star is, <laughs> let me put it here again, K-star is capital expansion, that's the subsumed class for delta C plus delta V divided by C plus V, and lambda is everything else. So I'll just sum of them, all the rest of them. So what that is, again, is, is the capitalists get their surplus and they distribute it to accumulate more managers and, and uh, uh, credit from banks and research and development and, and uh, rents on, on the land and so forth, etc. So they're expanding both their machines, their means of production, their labor power, and everything else. Then the question is, as I, as I said before, what might be some consequences of this? So first thing I want to examine here is the market impact. Okay, remember now, one of the conditions of existence of surplus value in capitalism are markets. So we want to ask now the impact of both of these on markets. So the first market I'm going to take is the labor power market, the so-called labor market. The other one will be the means of production market. So let me draw these two markets here, use standard economic analysis. So what I have here is the graph of a market. First one will be the labor power market. So let me write that labor market. Means of production, means of production market. Okay, means of production. You could read my writing, I hope. Labor power market. If it's a market, we're concerned with prices. So here I'm gonna put the price of labor power, price of means of production, and of course, supply and demand over here, and supply and demand over here. Supply of labor power, demand for labor power, supply of means of production, demand. So the supply and demand for these two inputs into capitalist production. And Marx spends some time, actually, in volume three, if I remember correctly, examining supplies and demands of a variety of different markets. He's well aware of the supply-demand analysis that we have on the whiteboard. Okay, so let's, what do we have here? <laughs> we have K-star expanding. That means the sh demand for labor power shifts to the right. Okay, that's an expansion, let me see, in the example that I gave you, if I remember correctly, this was 20 workers, this was 30 workers. So employment has expanded. Another way of doing that geometrically is the demand for labor power shifts to the right. All right, that's one result in the, in the labor power market. There's more employment for workers. The other result is that the price of labor power goes up. And I want to take a moment and do this very, very carefully. We start here at the first equilibrium, and we have the price of labor power equal to the Remember what V is. V is the, the little v, sorry. V is the total value of labor power divided by the number of workers and the hours that each works. So this is the value wage per labor hour. The value wage per, per is this dividing line, per labor hour. 
Okay? There's two worlds here. There is the market world, the supply and demand world. There is the value world. Okay? Two different worlds here. Now, as I've taught you, these two worlds overdetermine one another because everything overdetermines everything else. So the two worlds complexly shape one another, but analytically, I want just for the moment, keep them distinct so I can discuss each of them separately and then how they shape one another. But first, analytically, we have a increase in the price of labor power because, and I'll make that new, so this is the old, we have an increase in the price of labor power because of a change in the labor market caused in turn by what? A change in capital accumulation and lambda. Okay? So capitalists want to hire more workers. And I can add to that also because of lambda, they want to hire not just more productive laborers, but more unproductive laborers as well. So there's a change in the labor market for both productive and unproductive. To make it dramatic, I've just focused on the productive. But let's not forget that there's a demand for both more productive laborers and demand for more managers and so forth, etc. Okay? More clerks, I should say. You, the managers should be another different kind of labor market. So more unproductive labor in terms of more clerks and salespeople and so forth, as well as more productive laborers. So over here, to go back to this, we have a change in the price of labor power, but unless I say something else, there's no change in the value per labor hour. This one, by, by assumption, is unchanged. Why? Let's, let's examine this very carefully. The, the, the little v, I'll rewrite it over here, value of labor power divided by LH. Okay. In the numerator, this value of labor power, okay, this is the um, bundle of consumer goods necessary to reproduce the, the, the workers. So in the numerator over here is the value of the means, I'll use Marx's language, means of subsistence, consumer goods, to reproduce labor power so the worker can come the next day and sell his or her labor power. Well, by assumption, this has not changed. What is this? What, what causes this? What's the source of this? The socially necessary abstract labor time to produce the consumer goods to reproduce the labor power. And I'm, I'm assuming that it's not changing. It could change, it probably should change, but just for the sake of this analysis, if the socially necessary abstract labor time, that is, if the productivity of abstract labor does not change, then the quantum of social labor required to produce the consumer goods is unchanged, and hence the value per labor hour is unchanged, while there at the same time there's a change in the price of labor power. So if the little v doesn't change, there is a deviation of the price from the value. So what we have here is this interesting deviation, this amount, the price has deviated from the assumed unchanged value of labor power. By the same logic, the demand for means of production has shifted to the right. I'll write this new, signify this old, and hence by the same logic, the price of the C good, now started over here, the unit value, because don't forget, price is always a unit value. So the value of C divided by the number of C goods produced, that remains unchanged. So I'm assuming here there's no socially, there's no change in the socially necessary abstract labor time to produce the C goods, okay, in the means of production industry. That's what I mean by C goods. Whilst at the same time, the increase in demand for means of production means a higher price for the, 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 the means of production. So here too we have a deviation as a result of this expansion. Okay? So, to remind you where we are. The expansion, 
the K star plus the lambda that's rising, that's in turn caused an impact on these two major markets. There's impact on other markets as well, but I'm going to focus on these. <coughs> excuse me, impact on the labor power market, means of production, which is generally a rise in prices in those respective markets. Okay, that's the first step. Second step, we want to ask now, what's the consequence of this rise in prices in these two important markets? So I'm going to erase the board and begin to answer that question. Okay. Let's take the labor power market first. Workers then get a higher price of labor power. Capitalists have to pay this. That's the, all the workers, the value of labor power. But workers now are getting something extra that the capitalists have to pay, right? The cap, I'll put it here again. Supply of labor power, demand for labor power, the shift in the demand for labor power to the new, so this is the extra, this right here. Okay, that's what I mean by the extra. So the value for all the workers has remained, the change, has remained unchanged, because there's no change in the socially necessary abstract labor time to produce those wage goods. But, <coughs> but the capitalists have to pay, and then the workers receive something extra. So I want to examine now what is this extra. Well, in order for the capitalists to get access to labor power, they have to pay, as it were, a premium to the workers to gain access to labor power, a higher price. So the workers are in a favored position because of a change on the labor market in which they can sell their labor power for more than what it's worth. Remember worth now. Worth for Marx is the, socially is the abstract labor, the socially necessary abstract labor time, in this case, to produce the wage goods to reproduce that labor power. But that labor power is worth more in market prices than it literally cost in value prices. That's what this deviation means. So we can write that the capitalists have to take a portion of their surplus and distribute it to workers to gain access to that labor power commodity which they, necessary, which they need in order to produce. So this extra is a subsumed class payment and a subsumed class receipt for the workers. A subsumed class payment that the capitalists have to pay to the workers to gain access to this labor power. So that's a cost, an extra cost to the to the capitalists, and of course it's an extra revenue to the workers. I'll come back to the revenues in a moment. I just want to examine this cost. By the same logic, this is in labor power, by the same logic we have a price of the means of production, okay, that the worker, that the uh, um, uh, capitalists have to pay, pay, and a premium to get access to the same um, means of production, So the capitalists to get the machines, raw materials, and so forth because of a shift, I mean, I'll write it over here, supply of means of production, demand for means of production. So the curve has shifted to the right. We have this new demand curve for the means of production. What I mean there is this is this extra here, okay? So it's not just in the labor power market but there is an extra here, which I'm conceiving now as a subsumed class payment that the capitalists have to pay to whom? To other capitalists, because it's other capitalists that are producing these means of production. So this is an, uh, uh, an extra payment that some capitalists who need means of production are paying to still other capitalists who are producing and supplying those means of production, and hence they can sell their raw materials, their oil, and so forth for something extra which in Marxian terms we're interpreting, we're, we're, we're understanding as a subsumed class payment of some capitalists to other capitalists. Okay? So in both cases, um, this is a, 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 a market phenomenon 
in which the capitalist expansion has increased cost to expanding capitalists. And, and that extra cost, that extra cost to the expanding capitalists is a result of capitalist expansion. So capitalist expansion has created its own effect. It's not something from outside the system, it's something inside capitalism in which the costs have risen because capitalists are expanding. Okay. Third, what's the impact of these extra costs? So let me get a clean board and focus on that. Capitalists get a surplus, and as, as we've gone through in this course, I'm going to break it up into two parts. They have the K star plus the lambda, that is, they have the subsumed class payment, the delta C plus delta V. They have everything else. I'll s sum it up. Managers, land, you know, distributions to managers, landlords, and so forth, etc. But now they have two new ones as a result of this expansion. They have the payments they have to make to the workers plus the payment they have to make to other capitalists to get means of production. So this is the market consequence of expansion. Okay. This one here, just let me just to make it very clear what this is, okay, this is the price of labor power that has to be paid then in the uh, market. So this is the, you know, the price of the labor power that's now greater than the value times all the workers. So that's the subsumed class payment that has to be made. Okay. This one is the price of the means of production minus the unit value of the means of production, which I'm assuming again is unchanged times, uh, sorry, times all the means of production here that are purchased, okay? So these are the two subsumed class payments that the capitalists have to make. The deviation of labor power from the unchanged, assumed unchanged value, the deviation of the uh, price of means of production from the un assumed unchanged value. And if you look, if you look at the, the, the whiteboard where you're sitting there, the inequality goes this way. Okay? So if I'm assuming an unchanged appropriation of surplus on the, from the workers, then the costs, the right-hand side, the demands on the surplus have risen because of this market change. Again, to remind you, I keep saying, repeating it so we don't lose it, the change resulting from the very capitalist expansion itself. Okay. Marx then argues, and there's no necessity for this, okay, he himself would have relaxed this, but I did, just to get the point across, he argues that this inequality is a sign of crisis for the capitalists. Why? Because the demands on the surplus are greater than the surplus. So there's a variety of possibilities which should occur here. Number one, there could be pressure on the workers to increase their surplus as a result of this. The one he focuses on in volume one is the following. He argues that this very rise in cost, the way, or let me put it a different way, the, the way to deal with this inequality, he doesn't really argue so much that the surplus could rise, but the way to deal with the inequality is for this to fall. Now you could say, okay, this could fall and or this could fall, but I, I'm going to focus on what his argument is of volume one, is that the inequality gets solved by this falling. Okay, in other words, capital accumulation, the K star, diminishes in order to solve this problem. The very rising in costs make it more difficult for the capitalists to expand, and the way they deal with that is to purchase fewer labor powers, purchase you know, fewer means of production. Why? Because the prices of those inputs have risen. And you can also add to that, absolutely, that the uh, impact here is that the capitalists may go out and hire fewer managers, hire 
uh, uh, sorry, uh, borrow less from banks. Why? Because the cost of management and the cost of credit has risen. So I did not do this, uh, uh, but clearly the, this lambda is having an effect upon other markets, which would be the credit market, management market, land market, and so forth. As this is increasing, what does this mean? The demand for managers are shifting to the right, just like we did talked about a moment ago about the demand for labor power. The demand for management's labor power is shifting to the right. The demand for uh, credit is shifting to the right. The demand for land is shifting to the right. And hence, prices of those other inputs are going to start to rise. That is, the interest rate is going to start to rise, the rents are going to start to rise, uh, managers' salaries are going to start to rise, and hence there's going to be increased costs um, there too that the capitalists have to face. Okay? So in general, there's rising costs, rising prices of inputs throughout the, the, the capitalist economy. And that feeds back to affect the capitalist expansion. Here we can see then that there will be um, these new subsumed class payments that have to be made and indeed more subsumed class payments would have to be made to banks and to managers and, and for research and development and so forth which would be generated from this expansion. And Marx argues then there's going to be a cutback and the cutback he focuses upon is this one. So I'm going to follow the logic of volume one in particular and focus upon this one. Raise the board and then go back to our markets, okay, go back to the markets and ask, okay, what's going to now be the impact on the, these two markets, the supply of means of production, the demand for means of production, okay? Let me now, if I do, let me put the price so I don't lose this, price of labor power, the price of means of production. Okay, and supply, demand, supply, demand. Okay. All right. Let me write the, the old curve, the demand for labor power, in red. Okay. If you recall, it shifted to the right. Demand new. If you recall, it shifted to the right because of expansion. The expansion bid up the prices. As a result of that, Marx is assuming here that the demands for, for means of production and the demands for labor power, that K star plus lambda, are going to now start diminish because of these rising costs. So what he's assuming here graphically is that these curves are going to start to shift back. Notice the two shifts. So let me Notice the two shifts. We started with a shift this way as a result of expansion. The shift that way caused the prices, I'm, I'm going to put them in here, the prices to rise. The prices of means of production to rise. That's the N is the new. Okay. I just put in the blackboard, we uh, conceptualize that as additional subsumed class payments that had to be made to labor power and means of production. That created a crisis in which the demands on the surplus were greater than the available surplus. Capitalists react to that by purchasing fewer labor power, fewer means of production, which means the curve is shifting back, okay, in order to solve the crisis. So, Focusing upon this one for the moment, we can see that curve, the dotted red is shifting back just for the moment to, to, to kind of get it. Let's assume the curve shifts all the way back to the original line, okay? What do we then have in this market? If this red curve shifts all the way back, well, we have then an excess supply of people. This here is called, in economics, an excess supply of people, unemployment.
unemployed labor. Okay, so unemployed labor results in the market because the demand curve shifts back. By the same logic, this is an excess supply of means of production. The way the market works is this unemployed labor, this excess supply of means of production, will put downward pressure on prices, as you can see. The downward pressure on prices to correct this excess supply of means of production, excess supply of people. Marx comes up with a dramatic term for this, this unemployed labor as a result of the contraction in the demand for labor power. He calls it the reserve army of the unemployed. So this, in Marxian terms, lovely term, reserve army of the unemployed. And the reserve, again, the reserve army of the unemployed is internal to the system. It results, as a, it results as a consequence of the demand for labor power shifting back, my green, and I'm just making it dramatic, shifting it all the way back so you can see this reserve army of the unemployed. And the point of the reserve army of the unemployed, two points to it. One, it pushes down the price of labor power to correct the disequilibrium in the situation. Number two, it disciplines the workers so they will accept a lower price of labor power, otherwise they're going to be getting rid of. That is, the workers who are already working. So the reserve army, the unemployed, pushes down the price, the market price, to the unchanged value and thereby, thereby corrects the situation. The excess supply of means of production pushes down the prices uh, in the market, the market prices of means of production, and lo and behold, if that works, we have the following, to put it all together. Expansion causes a crisis because of rising input prices, okay. and that crisis serves to correct the crisis, how? By diminishing demands for labor power, diminishing demands for means of production and pushing down the very prices. So in, in a bizarre way, the crisis sets in motion the forces in society which correct the crisis. Okay, it's a kind of, you know, a bizarre way for capitalism to expand. The expansion creates a contraction, but the very contraction will solve the problem that brought it about by bidding down prices. Okay. So Marx has an argument here of, of how business cycles result um, uh, internally within capitalism. I mean, you don't have to look outside in terms of sunspots or agriculture or whatever. Inside industrial capitalism is the mechanism for the ups and downs. You might, looking at the board, you say, well, does it necessarily have to go here and here? Of course not. Uh, there's no control over these markets, so the, the, we can have the demands shifting all the way to the left, the dem, you know, demands for means of production shifting uh, all the way to the left, and prices could thereby fall. And the very prices falling, okay, in that situation, will create opportunities for capitalists to purchase this relatively cheap labor power and the relatively cheap means of production to set in motion, once again, the capitalist expansion, okay? So that's... Um, uh, one part of this story. The other part of the story, which I'm going to develop next time, is that this contraction need not occur. There's no necessity for the uh, contraction. And that's the next step, okay? So the first step is, yeah, capitalism has the potential for creating this, these downturns, but they need not happen. Just if you look at these, the, these two markets for the moment, they need not occur because it's quite possible for the supply of labor power to shift to the right, that is, the demand for labor power could be increasing, but if the supply of labor power shifts to the right, th that price need not rise. And Marx is going to develop that argument in Volume 1, and it's a very interesting and fascinating example in England of the time. It's also important in understanding the United States over the last 30 years, the changes in the labor power market and how the changes in the labor power market, specifically, how a shift in labor power to the right need not cause, doesn't necessarily, that the shift in the labor power to the, uh, uh, the shift in the supply of labor power to the right can offset any tendency for the price of labor power to rise. Okay, and by the same token, 
the supply of means of production can shift to the right, and hence a rising price of labor uh, means of production need not occur. There can also be other changes in, in the economy, which is that the, besides a shift in the supply and a shift in the uh, supply of labor power and means of production to the right. For example, I focused on rising costs to the capitalists of having to pay labor power uh, more. But that means that the workers have more earnings. So that means that the workers can take their earnings and go out and purchase more consumer goods and in so doing bid up the price of consumer goods. So the capitalists have to pay more for their input labor power and means of production, but they are also in a favorable situation in which they can sell their goods for higher prices because the workers are getting higher money wages. So I want to develop these contradictory results in the next presentation. Thank you.